Okay. Good. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the class, our course on BC214, Developing the Human Spirit. Let's take a moment to pray together and then we will get started today. Uh, could somebody please lead us in prayer? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the beautiful class we are about to have. God, we pray that you will help us to open our mind and heart and listen to the deep truths the pastor is teaching us so that we can develop our spirit, Lord, so that we can live a life that glorifies you and we can be a blessing to others. Be with us and guide us throughout the session. Give us the good Wi-Fi connection that we need for this section, Lord. Be with us. Let everything we do be done for your glory. We bless Pastor Ashes. I thank you for all my classmates. We give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Nikira One. So let's quickly review what we did um, last class, last week. I know this uh, has been a kind of a short course, uh, but uh, we introduced this course maybe one or two years, maybe two years back, I think. Uh, so there's only the third time we're doing this course. The whole uh, intent was uh, we want to uh, uh, really emphasize for all of us that we have to develop our spirit man, right? And that's one reason why we are here in the Bible College. Uh, we are going to gain knowledge, of course. We're going to learn a lot of things intellectually. But most importantly, we want to develop our spirit, our inner person, so we could be effective for God and in the service of God. Last class, we talked about the seven functions of the human spirit. That means the human spirit, what does it do? What does it do? What are the functions that it serves? And we enumerated these. First, we talked about the conscience, that the, the conscience is the voice of the human spirit. It tells us what's right and wrong. And the Holy Spirit, of course, is our guide. And if our conscience is right, meaning if we have a, our spirit is developed the right way, then the voice of the conscience will always be aligned to the voice of the spirit. There will be an agreement. Uh, the second function our spirit serves is in knowing spiritual things, receiving revelation or understanding of spiritual things. So our spirit understands many times even before our mind can comprehend. So we have to constantly live out of what we know in the spirit and not be limited to what we understand in our minds. Thirdly, we talked about communion or fellowship with God. So our God is spirit. He has created us as, us as spirit beings so that we can fellowship with them spirit to spirit, right? Uh, so we don't see God in the natural. Like, you know, like I'm seeing God, I'm shaking hands. No, I can't do that. But I can fellowship with God spirit to spirit, right? He is spirit. My spirit communicates or communes with God. Number four, the spirit serves as a container. So God fills us with his grace, his power is, fills us. And then from there, we dispense, we release to people. The spirit also carries our identity. This is who we really are. So the spiritual world recognizes us not based on our natural, who we are in the natural. Right? The spiritual world recognizes us based on who we are in the spirit. Right? So they see us as believers. They see us under the blood. They see us in Christ because that's who we are in the spirit. In the natural, we may be different things. You know, uh, we have different things in life, that's fine. But the spiritual world recognizes for who we are in the spirit. That we carry that identity in the spirit. Number six, it is our spirit that takes action, that gets things done in the spiritual realm and thereby affects the natural realm. So we must learn to do that. The moment there's an emergency, there's a situation in the natural, of course, there are things we can do in the natural and take care of things, yes. But we must also learn how to operate in the spirit, because our spirit can take action in the spiritual realm. And those things will then affect what's going on here in our 
natural world, right? And lastly, we said the spirit continues to grow. Uh, so there is continuous development. The spirit is continuing to develop, mature, increase in Christ likeness. So these are seven functions of the human spirit, and we should be aware of it and continue to grow in each of these seven areas. The last lesson or the last point, the last area that we want to cover is imparting spirit to spirit. That means just as in the natural, you know, uh, if you think about it in the natural, you can have, you know, uh, athletes can have coaches, uh, students can have teachers, uh, you know, so, so in the natural, there is some impartation of na knowledge or experience. Uh, that happens in the natural, so also in the spiritual. So we can impart spiritually to other people, and we can birth and nurture spiritually. You know? So we must understand that, that there is the possibility of spirit-to-spirit -spirit, uh, impartation or sharing or giving into other people's lives. Okay? So... Uh, uh, for example, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 3, the Apostle Paul is writing to the Corinthians and he tells them, you are a letter written by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit, written not on tablets of stone, but on your hearts. So he's saying, you are a letter that we've written. So imagine he's telling people, each one of you, you're a letter we've written. Okay, what's he saying? And then he says, he explains, so it's not a letter that we've written with ink on some stone or some paper. It's not a natural letter, but you are a spiritual letter. We have written by the Holy Spirit and we have written it in your hearts inside. You know, so you can think about that's what ministry is. When we are ministering to people, we are actually writing into their hearts by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is helping us to write into their hearts. And what is written in their heart is indelible. I Meaning you can't erase it with a with an eraser. It's not. It's not going to go. It's something for their life. You know, so uh, that's an example where we can impart into people's lives, into their very spirit, but it is empowered by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who helps us do that. So really in ministry, you know, whether we ministry to children or your teens or your youth or your adults or whoever, as you're ministering to people, we're actually imparting into their spirit, you know, and it is only done by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay. We see other examples in Romans 2.11. The Apostle Paul tells the believers at Rome, he says, I want to come to you and I want to impart to you some spiritual gift. So think about it. He's telling the Romans, I want to come to you. And I want to impart to you, I want to give to you something in the spirit, spiritual gift, something. You know? It's like when you go visit somebody, you will usually take some gifts, chocolates or something. Oh, we're giving them. But here he's saying, I want to come to you, but I want to give you something in the spirit, give you gifts in the spirit. I want to impart to you some spiritual gift, something in the spirit. You know, so you can imagine when we go from place to place ministering to different people, what we are doing is we are imparting spiritually, we're giving it as a free gift. Uh, it's not like they're paying money. You can't buy these things with money. You're giving it as a gift. You're imparting a spiritual gift into their lives, something that empowers them in the spirit. You know, uh, we see examples of Paul and Timothy. Paul tells Timothy, 1 Timothy 4, verse 18, he says, you know, I want to remind you of what was given to you by the laying on of hands of the eldership. Do not neglect the gift of God which is in you, which was given to you through prophecy 
by the laying on of the hands of the eldership. So that means when the elders, spiritual elders, they laid hands on Timothy, they prophesied over him, something was imparted into him. You know, a spiritual gift was imparted. And so Paul reminds Timothy, 2 Timothy 1 6, he says, Stir up the gift of God which is in you, which was given to you through prophecy and the laying out of my hands. So there's imparting of gifts. That means abilities, things you're able to do, those things are given of spirit to spirit. Right? So we must understand this that as you develop in your spirit spiritually, you can impart out of that into other people's lives. You can impart into their hearts. You can impart the gifts that God has given you. You can pass it on to people. But of course, there's a way on, in which, through which that happens, which we will be talking about. And connected to that, we can nurture people. We can reproduce in others what we have been developed in ourselves. So Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, he says, you know, uh, what, uh, did I turn the recording on? Yes, it's on. So I suddenly forgot, but did I turn it on or not? Okay. Uh, so Paul tells Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, he says, the things that you have learned from me, Commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. That means he's saying, Timothy, what I have given to you spiritually, you pass it on to others and tell them to pass it on to others. You know, So there is this whole transmission of spiritual things and the nurturing of spiritual things that is uh, happening. Okay? So as Paul has grown in the things of God, he's passed it on to Timothy and he's saying, Timothy, you pass it on to others and tell them to pass it on to other people as well. So uh, one of our goals in developing the human spirit and growing strong spiritually is so that we can impart to other people spiritually. Right? It's not like, OK, I develop everything, keep everything to myself, and sit down quiet. No. right? As you're developing in your spirit, as you're receiving revelation and truth and grace and gifting and anointing and empowering in your spirit, pour it out into others, release it into others, so that you can devil nurture and develop others in the spirit. Right? So some practical uh, truths on how spiritual impartation nurturing takes place just so that we do this properly okay uh, i'm going to just put these i've just shared these points down in the notes how this happens spiritual so how spiritual impartation and nurturing takes place so when we talk about impartation we're just saying we're transferring what we have received from our spirit we are passing it to somebody else that's what impartation is, right? Something. It's a grace. It could be a gift. It could be an empowerment. It could be a revelation. What we have received, we are passing on to other people. And we see this in the Bible, in the, both the Old and New Testaments. Uh, we see examples of it. We'll make mention of it. And uh, we can also receive just as we can give. In Romans 1.11, just as we receive, we can also give to other people, right? So... Uh, this is a genuine thing, it happens, but what are important insights? First, impartation is always aligned to God's call and assignment on your life. So when we talk about impartation, which is especially an impartation of grace and gifts, it is always aligned to the call of God, because God is not just, okay, I will simply give impart grace and gift and you do nothing with it, no. It's always given in alignment to the assignment that God has for your life and the call of God on your life. To be a worship leader. And I, 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 I worship God personally, privately. But I'm, I don't go up in front of people. I can't lead them in worship. So there's no point in me going to 
unless God gives that grace and gift, right? So there's no point in me going to some person and saying, who's a great worship leader, anointed worship leader, and say, please place your hands on me. I, I want to a double portion of your anointing. I want to become a worship leader. Well, that's not going to happen because that is not the call and assignment of God on my life. If it was God's call and assignment on my life, yes, that's there will be an impartation. There'll be a you know God can impart into my life the grace and gifting is put on that person. But when it's not part of God's call and assignment for my life, definitely I can have I can have that person just pray a gentle prayer for me. But the impartation of the grace and gift is not going to happen because it's not aligned to the call and the assignment on my life. Right? So God is not wasting this, right? There is a purpose behind all of this. So we must understand that. Secondly, impartation often takes place in a measure. The normal that, that we've seen, that you can see in Moses and the 70 elders, Moses and Joshua, Elijah and John the Baptist, is there was a certain aspect of what the person carried which was given to the other person. So when Moses, you know, when the anointing of God was taken up from Moses and placed on the 70 elders, they didn't become, all 70 of them, they didn't become like Moses. Right? No. There was a certain aspect which was the grace and the anointing to uh, judge the people or to lead the people in a certain degree. That was given. So they could then sit and um, take care of smaller groups of people. So that was imparted to the 70 elders. Uh, they didn't all become you know, like Moses, the prophet. Right? So there was an impartation, but it was given to them in a measure to do what God had called them to do. When Moses laid hands on Joshua, Joshua didn't go and start doing all the wonders that Moses did. He received a measure, which was specifically the wisdom of God, to lead the people into the promised land. And then, of course, yeah, God did some signs and wonders through Joshua, but not in the same way that he did through Moses. You know? So that we can say there was a measure given to Joshua, but not everything. He, Joshua did not become a copy of Moses. He did it. He had a different assignment, and he fulfilled it, and he was God imparted into his life. You think of Elijah and the John the Baptist. The Bible says John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah. But John the Baptist, there is no record of him doing a single miracle. Elijah did many miracles. But the Bible says John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah. So that means there was only one aspect of the anointing that was imparted to John the Baptist, and that was to turn the hearts of the people to God. Just as Elijah, in his men, through his ministry, the people were saying, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. Similarly, John the Baptist turned the hearts of the people to God. That was the measure, that was the uh, impartation or the transfer that happened. Right? So we must understand that in transferring, in imparting, it's always aligned to the call of God on the person's life. And there is a certain measure, a certain aspect that is imparted. It's not everything that's given. Yeah. The third thing is this, that whatever has been received through impartation has to be nurtured and developed. That means you don't impart something in its mature state. You impart something in its uh, nascent or in its initial state. And that gift and the grace has to be developed and nurtured. That's what Paul is telling Timothy. Timothy, don't neglect the gift that's in you. I want you to, I want you to stir it up. I want you to exercise it. I want you to make use of it. Don't leave it dormant. You know? So Timothy received an impartation, but he had to nurture and develop it. So everything re received through impartation has to be exercised. It has to be nurtured. It has to be stewarded. It has to be developed. Number four, you can go beyond what was imparted. That means we are not limited to the impartation we receive. Uh, the impartation is like a seed that's sown into you. Now you can develop it, you can you can increase it, you can increase in measure and in realms. You can go beyond what was received because it depends all on how you develop it and uh, grow in it. Number five, uh, you can receive impartation from more than one minister of God. You know, some people say, okay, 
you know, you can only receive from one person, only from your spiritual father and all of that. All that is not supported in scripture, right? God can give to you. He has raised up so many men and women in the body, obviously to impart into the lives of his people. So we receive impartation from multiple servants of God, multiple people of God. As God um, brings them into our lives, we can receive. Number six, and there are two important factors that uh, determine what we receive through impartation, which is our hunger and secondly, our assignments. That means we must be hungry for that kind of grace and gifting and pursue that inten intensely. And second, it must be aligned to the call of God on our lives. Right? So both must be there. And if I'm hungry, I'm eager for something that's not aligned to the call of God, that's not going to happen unless God has that as part of his calling on my life. Right? So both these things have to be uh, in alignment, the hunger, of, hunger for it and the assignment of God on our lives. And God can, you know, God can at times uh, sovereignly impart that he can initiate that impartation you know sometimes when you're not even thinking about it somebody comes lays their hands on you and impart something yeah god can do that uh, but normally you're hungering for it and it's connected to your the assignment of the call of god on your life number seven uh key to impartation is association and honor uh, as we saw in the bible you know, um, Joshua and Moses, Eli Elisha and Elijah, uh, or Moses and the 70 elders, or Paul and Timothy, or Paul and Titus, there was association. They kind of knew each other, they worked together, and there was honor. And so that kind of facilitates the transmission of grace and anointing. Right? I'm not saying it's exclusively that, because God can work up apart from it, but normally that's how it happens through association and honor. Uh, impartation can take remotely, that means it can happen through distance. Today, you know, we can read books, we can listen to messages, we can observe from a distance, and God can uh, do that. Uh, we see an example of uh, Elijah and John the Baptist. These two people never met, they lived hundreds of years apart, and yet the Bible says that John the Baptist came in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Yeah, so that means over centuries, and I think I will mention that again later on, um, over centuries there was a transmission across generations. There was an impartation of certain grace and gift. Number nine, uh, impartation cannot be purchased with money. Uh, and I just want to emphasize this because sometimes people say, you know, you give an offering and you'll get my anointing and all that. That doesn't happen. You know, you can give as much money as you want. That will not make the anointing come on you. Because anointing, this is a gift of God. This is a work of grace. And uh, uh, sure, you can partner with people. You can, you know, be a part of what they're doing by giving financially. But you cannot buy their anointing or buy their grace or gift through uh, money, right? And that's so made so very clear for us that in Acts 8, you know, the Simon the sorcerer wanted to buy the grace to uh, impart the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And Peter rebuked him. He said, your money perish with you. So we cannot buy spiritual things. Number 10, a double portion can only be received from God. That means no man can give beyond what he has. So if you want more than what a person has, you'll have to go to God because everything we receive comes from God ultimately. So remember, in impartation, you're not receiving from the man, you're receiving from God through the individual. Right? The individual is only a channel. But if you want more than what the individual carries, then we have to go to the source, that is God himself. Right? Uh, so a double portion can only be received from God because everything we ultimately receive will come from God himself. He's the source of the grace, the gift, the anointing. And the last point is this, that uh, impartation can take place across generations. So, you know, John the Baptist, he walked in the spirit and power of Elijah. They never met. There were generations in between them. But God determined this was going to happen. And so it did happen. Can God do the same thing today? Yes, of course. Uh, that God can raise up people today who may walk in 
an anointing or a certain grace or a certain gift that somebody many generations ago walked in in similar manner. But that is a work of God. And you know, it's not something that we dictate, but that's a sovereign work of God. So keep these thoughts in mind when we talk about you know imparting into people's lives. You know, this is how impartation happens. Uh, this is how we can give into their lives. So we as we associate together, as we work together, uh, there's an impartation that takes place. Uh, we receive, but it can, you know, uh, uh, it's it's according to God's plan and call. We can't force something into uh, somebody, you know. So it doesn't mean that, you know, um, uh, everybody's going to be a carbon copy of, you know, the person who's doing the impartation. No, it's going to be always according to God's call and God's plan for their lives. Let me pause here and see if there are any questions um, on this subject. And then after this, I will do a full review of uh, the course. Uh, any questions on this, on nurturing uh, and impartation? Go ahead, Jeffrey. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so once it happened with me, uh, a person genuinely came and he wanted to pray for me. Uh, and then he suddenly started saying, I'm imparting everything to you. Uh, but then, uh, I mean, I didn't think about it later or uh, I didn't feel anything. Or, uh, I didn't even think like that's the prayer that I kind of needed or something. Like, uh, I didn't, I was not even thinking about getting his gifts into me or something. So, uh, I mean, I just want to know like. Uh, is it is it really nice or good to go to someone suddenly and then say like I'm imparting all my gifts to you? Uh, when I was standing and listening to his prayers, I was wondering why why he's doing all these things. Uh, yeah, that's what I wanted to know. Is it really good uh, a good way to approach someone like this and then suddenly say I'm imparting all my gifts to you? I'm imparting the grace. I'm imparting the power and stuff. I felt very different that day, but then yeah, I just want to know. Yeah, so the answer is two things, right? One is, was the Holy Spirit genuinely leading him? And was God really in it? Or was he operating purely, uh, was the person operating purely out of their own mind? You know, because sometimes we can go do it on our own. You know, oh, I'm giving uh, everybody here, stand up, everybody receive my anointing, my grace, and all that. Uh, you know, that usually amounts to nothing. You know, it's something, if we are doing it by our own selves, uh, it may be, it may seem like a very spiritual thing, but no, it really amounts to nothing. But if the Lord is in it, then yes, there will be some fruit coming out of it. So the real test is in the fruit, right? Jesus said, you know, Matthew 7, he said, by the fruit you will know them. So how do we test something? Look at the fruit. What was the outcome? Was there some immediate change in the area of ministry? Or did you recognize certain gifts? Did you recognize certain grace flowing and operating in your life that you didn't have before? That would be the evidence of a Uh, sorry. 
Um, sorry, I lost connection in between. Um, back now. Yeah, so what we were saying is, um, so the, we will know them by the fruit. So the real test is if there was, is there was the initial evidence of uh, certain, the receiving of certain gifts or grace or anointing uh, or even revelation, uh, then you know that, okay, some impartation has taken place. Otherwise, if we are operating on our own accord, in our own mind, then usually nothing happens. It's just a, you know, exercise we go through. But if the Holy Spirit has led it, if the Holy Spirit... Okay, sorry about that. Um, once again, the connection went off and came back. I I hope it doesn't go off again. Um, okay, so the second part that we were saying has to do with our desire, right? So we need to be desiring the the impartation you know that god i want that what's happening i want that i want to see it in my life got a desire for it so that's important uh, so these are two important things right so if uh, just speaking towards what jeffy now was sharing um if god was directing it if there was desire for it yeah then that's the normal way through which impartation happens now god is sovereign uh, so sometimes god directs it even when we are not aware that's that's fine, but I'm just talking about the normal. I'm just talking about the normal way in which impartation happens. That is, God directs it, and usually we are seeking for it, we're desiring for it, and then God directs the impartation. We are seeking for it, and then impartation happens. But God is sovereign, so sometimes when we are not even aware or not knowing, God can direct, and impartation can happen. But usually the evidence will be there, the fruit will be there, that, you know, something is beginning, some, something has changed in my spiritual journey, uh, either in terms of the grace or the gift or the anointing or the revelation. Something has come up in my life. That means I know in partition, something has been given to me in the spirit. Okay, sorry about the interruptions.
Um, I'm not sure today where we've had these problems happen. Thing. Um, to okay, uh, is okay now? Can hear me? Or it's a little blurry, but it's still okay. Um, is it? Blurry? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. So. Uh, Let's try to see if we can make progress today. Otherwise, we will have, we'll meet again. Uh, is there any other questions that um, there any questions that you would anyone would like to ask? Uh, hopefully, this connection won't go again. But let's see if there uh, any okay. questions. Uh, but I have a question uh, regarding impartation. Would it be possible for um, demonic powers also to be imparted if that? The, the man of uh, the person who is operating the gifts, who is imparting, is operating under the uh, influence of the enemy. Uh, just wondering because uh, mm -hmm. sometimes people um, uh, initiate themselves to come forward and um, and and impart and say, uh, take give money, take and <laughs> stuff. So would it be possible to happen mm -hmm. that way also? Yeah. So, uh, in theory, so the, 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 you know, let we look at the full picture. In theory, there is a possibility that if a person is operating under familiar spirit, so let's say there is a believer, uh, a man of God, whatever, and uh, certain areas of his life are not right, right? So that means in that area, he's actually given room to familiar spirit. So he, he may be a believer. Uh, operating under the Holy Spirit in certain aspects, but in other aspects, he's operating actually under the influence of familiar spirits because he has accommodated that. And that's possible because in that, those areas, he would have compromised and he has given room to familiar spirits. Now, when that person lays hands and prays, if the person is compromised in the same area then those it is it is possible I'm, I'm saying here it theologically or theologically it is possible those familiar spirits will begin to attach themselves to this person if here so example let's say pornography is a weakness in his life and He's, he's given room for it. He's in, he himself is in bondage to pornography, which means in that area of his life, actually, unclean spirits have him captive. He's weak, and they are actually operating in his life in that area. If he lay hands on praise for somebody who that person is also has a weakness for pornography, then it's an open door where these familiar spirits can accommodate and begin to affect this person and his his weakness will be worse. I'll just give you an example. In theory, this is possible. But as believers, when we go forward to you know, have hands laid on us, we have no idea. You know, We may not know anything about that pastor or the preacher who's laying hands on us. We don't know about his personal life. We don't know what are his areas of weakness. So what do we do? We make sure that we ourselves have our under proper standing before God, that we are walking in faith and love and holiness and, you know, with uh, with our life in proper submission to God. That means we will not be affected even if that person has a certain weakness. So, you know, you know my life, if, if my life is all covered, uh, let's say that past person laying hands on me, he's anointed and I'm going to receive off the anointing on his life, let's say in his certain area, the, you know, uh, there are certain unclean spirits operating. But if I keep my life covered, the door's shut. I'm not going to receive, or I'm not going to be able to, I'm not going to entertain those unclean spirits because I've kept the doors closed in my life. But I can receive of the good things that are in his life, which is the grace and the anointing, the gifting that God has put in him. So that's how we should operate. That means before we go to receive, make sure we're closed, we're covered, we're focusing on the right thing, we can receive. And we don't have. We can receive the good things, and not of if there are any negative things. 
Is that okay? okay? Did I answer your questions? Yeah, 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 yes, first, yes, first. Uh, first of all, sir, in First Timothy 522, uh, do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in other people's sin, keep yourself pure. Uh, does this also imply when we impart to others, or is it just appointing people as leaders? Uh, but it also says that nor share in other people's sin. Uh, so could you share some light on that? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So the context of First Timothy 5 is really about, you know, uh, when you go back a few verses, Paul says, against an elder, do not receive an accusation except in the mouth of two or three witnesses. So the context is eldership. Then he says, those who are sinning, rebuke before all that all may fear. That means if an elder is continuing in sin, then you have to publicly rebuke him because you know he's an elder. He's, he's got responsibility of the, uh, of the people of God. Then people of God are watching him and you need to publicly expose his wrongdoing. Then in that context, he says, lay hands suddenly on no man and do not be partaker on other men's sins. That means do not hastily appoint somebody into eldership because if we appoint somebody in, in, in eldership, we are actually participating in their wrongdoing. If we, we are like, you know, we in English we say, we are becoming an accomplice to their crime because we are endorsing their wrong doing by actually laying hands and appointing them to a place of leadership if they are part, you know continuing in sin so that's the context the context is eldership and how to deal with the sin of the eldership and not to appoint somebody to eldership if they are actually doing sin living in sin because then we actually become accomplices to their sin by endorsing them and putting them into a place of leadership so in that context is lay hands suddenly on no man and do not be a partaker of their sins keep yourself pure Right? So in that context, so we don't want to, it's not like yes, if yes, yes. I lay hands on somebody, their sin begins to affect me. Lay hands on somebody and endorse them. Yeah, I don't want to. Yeah. Good. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah, welcome. All right. So in this course of so through you know uh, what we covered and I've given full course notes so I encourage you to uh, read through it and I feel there's a lot more in the scriptures that we need to dig out and explore and I hopefully uh, you know as I go along and I keep learning more I'll put it into a book and share it and of course try to apply it to my life and share yeah, some share more practical things but what we've tried to cover is, I'm just going through the overview of the course. Now we emphasize that we are tripart beings, spirit, soul, and body, but we are primarily spirit beings. The spirit is the most important part of us. And the condition of our spirit affects both the soul and the body. So we have to keep our spirit strong and full of the things of God. Uh, we lo looked at some analogies of the human spirit. You know, the human spirit is compared to a vessel, is compared to a house, is compared to a temple. And so, you know, you can learn some things about the human spirit by looking at those analogies. And we said that our human spirit is given to us so that we can actually connect with the spiritual realm. We can... So, even though we are living in the natural world and we spend so much of our time with the natural world, we can actually connect with the spiritual realm and engage in the spiritual realm through our human spirit. Then we talked about the five faculties of the human spirit, which we need to develop. Uh, we talked about seeing, hearing, feeling, uh, smelling, and tasting. We need to continue to develop these faculties because they enable us to see and experience spiritual things, what God is giving to us. We talked about, uh, actually I moved this chapter here, but we talked about you know uh, seven steps or seven ways by which we can develop and train our spiritual senses through the word, through meditation, through worship, through quietness in the presence of God, through the declaration of the word of God, we develop and strengthen our spiritual man. We talked a little bit about walking in the spirit, how Paul says, if we are living out of the spirit, then two things, we must be led by the spirit and we must walk in the spirit. So we have life in the spirit, we live in the spirit, 
but practically we have to be led by the spirit and we have to walk in the spirit that means let all that we do be governed directed by the holy spirit then we talked about the seven functions of the human spirit and do in us and today we talked a little bit about how we came part to our people spirit to spirit that is the gift the grace the anointing and the revelation god has given to us in our spirit we can pass on to other people or we ourselves can receive from other people but there is the right way to do it and we should do it properly right so that's kind of what we've covered in this course i hope you found it useful and uh, uh i've said the full course notes um uh, which you can use so uh, we will put out the assessment for this course uh, you can do the assessment it's an open book open bible assessment and um, hopefully in the coming days we will expand these notes into a book and share a lot more uh, but continue to build on whatever information we've shared take it forward strengthen yourself in it okay uh, so we end this course here i will close in prayer and uh, I look forward to meeting you again in uh, some other course. Could somebody close in prayer, please? Lord, we thank you for this time of learning. We um, pray, O oh God, that everything that we have learned through this course, we'll be able to apply this in our lives and help us to strengthen um, and work on our inner man, and, uh, be in constant touch with your Holy Spirit and to develop our human spirit, oh God. We pray that we would see the change even in our personal life and also the ministry that each one of us are involved in. Uh, pray and thank you for this course, God. Thank you for Pastor. Thank you for uh, all that you've learned through these uh, weeks, oh God. We thank you in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor. See you again soon. Bye. Now.